Thank you for joining us this evening to talk about dealing with the challenges of cancer of childhood, dealing with the challenges of childhood cancer and child in <laughs> cancer treatment. Um, this is part of a webinar series that we've been doing over the past several months here at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. The series is supported by Arms Wide Open Cancer Childhood Cancer Foundation, so we want to thank them for their support. I'm Dr. Megan Marsak, and I'm a pediatric psychologist here at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. One of my roles here at the hospital is to help develop and evaluate programs that are to help families and kids deal with the effects of illness and injury. So today we're gonna to spend a few minutes talking about the challenging aspects of pediatric cancer treatment. We're gonna talk about some of the resources available and then we're gonna spend some time talking about the development of the cancer, the Selly Cancer Coping Kit. And right here I have Selly with me um, so you'll hear more about Sally as the presentation progresses. So before we get started, just to give you some information about how this chat and chat will work, um, we have a moderated chat where we have a video feed below the chat window. So you can use the window to connect with each other. You can also submit your questions using the chat window. The questions are going to be posted as they're answered um, during the scheduled question and answer breaks. We're going to be reviewing each post before it's published, so you might notice a slight delay in the post or in your post as comments or questions as we progress along. Um, a quick disclosure before we get started. I am a co-inventor of the Sally Cancer Coping Kit, and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and I have filed a provisional patent for the kit, and we may benefit financially from the kit. Revenue will be steered back into research in accordance to CHOP's nonprofit status. So talking a little bit more about the challenges of cancer. So we really wanted to spend some time tonight chatting about what is hard about cancer and its treatment. And we want to make sure that we point out that there's more than just post-traumatic stress symptoms and other significant psychological symptoms. If you've joined us for some of our other webinar series, um, we discussed in detail the symptoms of post-traumatic stress and how various family members experience post-traumatic stress sometimes with cancer treatment. We've talked about it in the terms of siblings as well as parents and pediatric cancer patients themselves. However, I think it's really important to note that beyond post-traumatic stress symptoms, there are things that are just hard about the day-to-day -day treatment of cancer and the day-to-day -day management of having cancer in itself. Um, so some aspects of cancer are really challenging for every family. So we don't want to discount those. Even if you're doing really great, your child's adapted really well, you're feeling like you're managing it, there's still some things that are really hard. And there might be some tips or techniques that you can use that can make it a little bit easier for your family. So when we think about what's hard about cancer, we can think about it across the spectrum. So there are things that families tell us are really challenging during diagnosis, during treatment, for some families experiencing relapse or fearing relapse, and then moving on to either survivorship or end of life and end of life care. And in either of those avenues, they're very different but very challenging stressors for families. So learning more from our families, um, we're going to talk about a research study that we conducted here at CHOP um, with part of our team. This research study was led by Amy Hildebrandt, one of our graduate student team members. And during the study, what we really wanted to know from families was not just what is traumatic about cancer and its treatment, but what's hard. What are those, again, day-to-day -day things that you have to manage that are challenging for you and your family? And if you take a look at this slide, what we asked children and what we asked parents is what is hard for your child and about cancer and cancer treatment? And for children, we asked what's hard for you about cancer and cancer treatment? We were not asking about what was hard for parents. So we were really focusing in on what is hard for our pediatric cancer patients. And there. So what we learned is parents know a lot about their kids. If you take a look at this list, you'll see that a lot of the stressors that children identified, parents also identified. And we know um, we were able to group these into kind of four different categories, the first of which being just cancer treatment and side effects. So you can look across there and see a number of the different things that kids and parents identified as stressful about treatment. Things like hair loss, pain, needle sticks, taking medication, um, visits at the hospital, staying overnight at the hospital, some sleep difficulties. So some of those stressors I think would probably be obvious to most pe people and most um, 
patients. Like pain, yeah, definitely, that would be hard. Hair loss is a, is a stressor that we've identified for our, a, a number of, you know, people most, mostly identify with that. But things like sometimes needle sticks, which seem maybe to be not such a big deal, but actually can become really problematic for some children and families, particularly if families have to uh, administer medication at home and have to use injections for those in administrations. We also know that distressing emotional reactions can be really challenging for families. So sometimes if you have the treatment and side effects unmanaged and you're feeling like that's going well and those things are okay, that doesn't take away the fear and the nervousness. Feeling some uncertainty is something that we hear from our families time and time again. And you can't predict what's gonna happen. You don't know what's gonna happen with treatment. You don't even know sometimes how the child, your child is gonna feel the next day. So that, that's something that we know can be really challenging. We also know that there's a number of things that are just basic disruptions in your daily routine. You know, kids really want to be normal. They want to be like their friends. They don't want to miss school, which some parents might laugh about because, you know, they're trying to stay home from school when they're healthy and doing well, but then they're sick and they want to go to school, you know, because that's what their friends are doing and they don't want to be restricted. We also noted um, some social and peer group challenges, and this all came from our parents' report of what they've noticed was hard for their kids. None of our kids said that um, you know, they were having trouble with teasing or bullying, but several of our parents were able to identify that this was challenging for their kids. Um, and this is not the only study that has looked at the stressors that kids experience, but this is one that we've done here, and we have both um, what kind of what parents perceive and what ch children perceive. So we can take a look here. I think it's always really helpful, um, and it brings it close to home when you really see what are kids saying. Like So again, this is from the same research study. Um, kids are talking about, if you look at the first quote up there um, from the child who's about 10 years old, they were saying, you know, I didn't know if I was gonna survive and I was really afraid of my hair falling out. And so as an adult, I think a lot of times the things that we focus on are the survival, the fear of death, you know, how is treatment gonna go? But at the same time, this child was equally as concerned about their hair falling out. So that gets something really important to make sure we're communicating with our kids about and make sure that we know what's going on for them. And again, you can see um, one of the quotes up there talks about being afraid of the port being accessed. And I think it, one of the things that I've heard in clinics sometimes is, you know, we're not, we are kind of surprised when kids fear port access because it's not something that is expected to be painful. You know, we use it so that it can make treatment easier. But for kids, it's a really scary thing sometimes, even if they have their port accessed every week. And then again, something as simple as sleep can be really stressful for kids. So the one child talks about how it was hard just to lay down and to be able to get rest because they felt dizzy and then they are having problems with their IV and they have to go to the bathroom and they try to settle down and they get dizzy all over again. So something as, as simple as sleep becomes something that can be really challenging during treatment. So again, hearing from our parents. So what are our parents telling us? Um, so being petrified and terrified from needles. And you can see the one parent of an 11-year-old um, noted that their daughter um, wasn't initially afraid of needles, but somehow developed this fear along the way and became terrified of needles. And during cancer treatment, there's a lot of blood draws, often a lot of needles, sometimes transfusions, lots of things that require needles. So for this family, that became something that was significantly difficult. The, some of the parents there talk about, you know, the child being afraid of dying. Um, and we hear that with some kids. Some kids, that's not even on their radar at all. So those are things we don't make assumptions about, but those are things that some kids are afraid of or have overheard in the background. We want to make sure that we know that some kids are thinking about those sorts of things. And then again, um, a parent of a nine-year-old tells us, you know, he just wasn't himself, really wanted to be normal really wanted to be able to play with his friends, um, and that was really the hardest for him. It wasn't taking the medications, it wasn't um, the necessarily all the procedures that he was going through, it was that he was missing the time with his friends. So you can see across these different quotes that um, these different challenges are affecting parents and kids day to day, but they're different for every family, and the most distressing thing is different from one family to the next. So once we established, okay, yep, we know there's a lot of different stressors that families have to deal with, um, and now we've documented these different stressors, we wanted to learn how are cancer centers supporting their pediatric patients? 
And so we did an anonymous survey, and this is um, with about 33 parents who were able to, to respond. This was posted via listservs on cancer, um, on cancer listservs. Um, and we wanted to understand better kind of what's going on, what are the resources that are available. So most of our parents reported that they didn't feel that their child was well prepared for many of the very stressful aspects of cancer, and then there were really few resources available to address the emotional impact of cancer. They explained, a lot of them, if you take a look, parents were not upset with the care that the hospitals were delivering. They were really pleased that hospitals were focusing on their child's health, and they knew that they were really focusing on curing their cancer, focusing on treating the disease. And so it's not like the hospital was doing something wrong or poor, but they were neglecting some of the emotional aspects or some of these challenging things that we know exist on a day-to-day -day basis for many of our families. Um, so we're gonna pause um, right now and take any questions that you have. Um, so one of the questions that we we're getting are, is, are there things about cancer that are particularly harder for younger children versus older children? And so this is a really great question. One of the things that we've noticed, you know, working with our patients over time is that the different stressors really vary depending on family and depending on the child. Um, younger kids might be more focused on the immediate future, more focused on coming to clinic that day and missing a birthday party or um, focused on the things that they know are gonna happen. While older children do have a longer term kind of mindset so they might understand that some of the long-term effects of treatment could affect different things that they want to do in the future, could affect their sports careers, or could affect other things that they have going. Um, but for the most part, I think really asking kids and trying to understand that it does vary for every child and, and every adolescent. So I think that's it, all the questions that we have for right now. So we'll continue on. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about what can we do about it. So we know that these challenges exist. So we're going to talk about, you know, what, how do we deal with these challenges, and then what are some resources that are available to help us deal with these challenges. So I think one of the things that is most helpful that we encourage with our families is definitely communication. So like we said, if you looked across those various stressors um, that families um, had had taught us about that they were experiencing, they were really different. Not every family was experiencing every stressor. So the first thing that I think is really important is really discovering the challenges. So talking with your children, talking with your patients, um, figuring out what's going on for within your family and within your patients, um, and then assessing the level of challenge. So, you know, we mentioned, you know, some of them are day-to-day -day challenges that, you know, maybe you can brainstorm ideas together about and come up with a solution that is working for your family. Or maybe you might have to talk to your medical team and get some ideas. Um, also, the most effective solution depends on the challenge. So one, something that will work both for one procedure might not work for another procedure. So really thinking about what is this particular challenge and what are the specific things that we can do to deal with that challenge. And again, Thinking about what works for your family. So one thing that we hear sometimes is um, families tell us, oh, I was in the grocery store and somebody heard that my child had cancer and then they told me six different stories about all the people that they knew who had cancer and what they did and what we should do. And you know, sometimes people give a lot of unsolicited advice. And so sometimes that advice is helpful. So if it's something that applies to your family, you know, you can filter it down and see if it works. Um, but different things work for different families, and I think that's really important both for our medical professionals to know as well as our families and parents who are helping support children. And then using social support. So we know this is one of the things that can be most protective and most helpful for families. So if somebody from your community is offering to make dinner, offering to drop something off, offering to help with your other kids, definitely taking them up on that. Um, we know that cancer is a, can be a really long journey, um, so really accessing that support when you have it. Sometimes for kids that means bringing their friends in as much as possible, um, or talking to their siblings, and trying to come together as a family and as a community. And then the next thing to think about is, you know, if, if you try something, you know, you know, it's not a bad idea to try it if it doesn't work. Find something else, try again. Um, talk to more people, get more ideas, um, but you know, not just think that, well, this is just how it is, this is what we just have to deal with it, but really trying to 
make some changes if something is really bothering you and your family. And then utilizing available resources. So we're going to talk more about some of the resources that are out there. So I'm going to mention this briefly. So I know um, many of you who are watching, um, maybe family members or parents who have kids with cancer. Um, so these resources we're just going to talk about that are resources to use with a psychosocial team. And so these are for if you have access. These are we th I thought they were important to mention so that you can ask your medical team about them so that you know that they're out there if you feel like you need this kind of assistance. The Skip ND program was um, created by Ann Kazak, and there's been some research out there that shows that it can be helpful for some family members. It's a program that's de designed for parents to participate in or caregivers of cancer patients. Um, the purpose is really to enhance communication and to prevent um, post-traumatic stress from developing and to promote, promote positive adjustment to cancer. And it's a quick um, three-session treatment that has to be delivered by a mental health professional. So again, that is if you have a resource, um, that's something that you can ask them about using. Two more resources that are available. These are available freely for professionals to use. One is Shop Talk, which is a game. And the other one is called This Is My World Workbook. And so those materials are, again, to help communication about cancer, cancer treatment, the feelings around cancer, and, and how you're dealing with it. And those resources are, again, more for use um, within therapy or treatment with kids. And finally, I just wanted to mention, if you or your family is having significant trouble where you're having symptoms that, you know, they're keeping you from work, they're keeping your child from school, people are up at night, they can't sleep, they're really disruptive, there's some treatments out there that can be really helpful that have been shown to really help our families um, overcome some of those difficulties. Um, and so some of those treatments include cognitive behavioral techniques, imagery, hypnosis, or some pharmacological approaches. Um, so if you're feeling that if you're at the level where you might need some extra help, those are some um, techniques that might be helpful for you and things to ask either your mental health professionals about or ask your medical teams about. So now we're going to move on to resources that can be used directly by families. Um, this res the resources uh, up on the slide right now is resource developed for teens. These are both developed and supported by the Starbright Foundation. And the first one there is called Coping with Chemo. And that's an interactive um, website where you teenagers can go on and click on different videos and hear stories from other teenagers about how they dealt with different aspects of treatment. For example, um, you know, what, how do they feel at initial diagnosis? You know, what are they doing when their hair is falling out? How do they tell their friends about cancer treatment? And you can go online, and that's a free resource. Um, it's aimed for adolescents, um, so it's not meant for kids. The material there is really um, developmentally appropriate for adolescents. The other resource up there is, is a online space through starbrightworld.org. You can find it. And that's where teens can connect with other teens with chronic illness. That is not limited to kids with cancer. That is more general for kids with chronic illness. Um, and those resources, um, there's been shown that when kids use resources to connect to each other, like the Starbright world right there, um, it can help with kids feeling a little bit less lonely, um, potentially being able to communicate again about their disease better. The next resource I'm going to talk about has also been developed for teens with cancer, and this is called Remission. This is freely downloadable, so if you go to that website, you can download it for free. And this resource was really developed to help with education and adherence to cancer treatment. So this was hope, the goal of this was to help teens be committed to the medical regimens that they're following, um, to take their medications as they're supposed to, to learn more about cancer, you know, and to feel that they were not alone and normalize some of the experiences. In this game, um, you get a robot named Roxy, I believe, and you walk through the world and, you know, blast cancer cells and navigate, like, the inside of a body um, and learn about cancer facts along the way. And some of the research with this tool has suggested that it does help teens learn more about their cancer and it can also um, help facilitate taking medications effectively. 
And then the last resource I just want to mention here is the Cellular Cancer Coping Kit. And we're actually going to talk a lot more about this as we move along. Um, but this is the re uh, one of the few resources that were designed for children. Um, so I'm going to actually pause here for questions before we move on to talking about the development of the kit. Okay, so we got one really good question um, that somebody asked about their child feeling very scared when she's seeing other children who are further along in treatment and who look much sicker than she does. How can I help her feel less nervous about seeing the other patients? I think that's an excellent question, um, and I think very true for a lot of kids, um, not this, not just this, this child that you're mentioning. Um, so I think, again, one of the things is to really communicate um, with your child, your daughter, um, and talk to her about, you know, what are the things that she's afraid of? You know, when they're looking sick, trying to understand what does that mean to her, um, understanding um, what her treatment is and trying not to compare to other kids in clinic. We generally recommend that um, kids are given as much information as possible about their disease, but again, that is developmentally appropriate for their level. So depending kind of on your daughter's age as well, I think really trying to have a refocus on what's going on with her and what you can do to get through the day-to-day -day of, of her treatment. Um, those are those are strategies that we sometimes use with our patients, and we can um, continue to talk about, you know, feeling scared and dealing with cancer treatment as we move along and talk about the Celly coping kit as well. Okay. So talking, bringing it back to the Celly cancer coping kit. Um, so you see the Celly sitting next to me, possibly seen it on screen at some point here. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the goals, and then we'll talk about you know, how to use it and um, what are the different components of it. So when we developed this kit, we really wanted to create something that was evidence-based. And what we mean by evidence-based is that we wanted to look into the research and see what are the effective strategies that we already know that can help kids with cancer, and let's integrate those into a resource that's in one place for our kids and families. We wanted to create something that was low cost so that we could get it out to as many kids with cancer and their parents and families as possible. We also wanted to create something that was really easy to implement without a mental health provider. And so as we mentioned before, there's a number of resources that have been really helpful for families when they have a mental health provider. But every family doesn't need a mental health provider and sometimes doesn't have access to one. So we really wanted to build on what family strengths were and develop something that could be directly used by parents and their families. We also wanted to create something that was really specific to the experience of cancer and its treatment and create something that we could tailor to every, every family. So one of the things that we've been talking about as we've moved along this presentation is how different families experience things different and different things are difficult for different children. So we wanted something that could be tailored um, for each family and each child. We wanted to create something that was developmentally sensitive to children so that they would find it engaging and interesting. We wanted it to be engaging for families. So we know particularly at the time of new diagnosis, families are given a lot of information, a lot of materials. So we wanted to create something that would kind of stand out, that didn't get mixed up in the pile of the many, many materials that families have to sort through so that when they were able to return back and think about some of the emotional aspects and some of the things they were feeling, they had something that was obvious that they could refer back to. We also wanted to create something that could easily be integrated into physical care. And so we wanted something that doctors and nurses could figure out, okay, here's, here's um, a tool. How do I use that in my practice? How do I use it with my families? So that they could be used both by families but also integrated into the care by their families and physicians. So in developing the kit, we re looked at past research. So like I mentioned, we looked at what are the different things that families find stressful about cancer, and what are the different things that people know that help reduce that stress. We then took all of the materials and we had oncology experts review the materials. And then we then took all of our materials to families of children with cancer and had them review all the materials and ensure that we weren't missing information. 
Um, and then after we did all that, um, we conducted more research on the kit. We are continuing to collect ideas, so I just ideas. So I just want to mention, if you have them either during this presentation or later, feel free to send them along. So talking a little bit more about the kit, um, there each kit contains a celly critter, um, which you'll see featured right here on the right, um, the coping cards and caregiver book. And so the we're going to talk about each part of those kits. Celly is a stuffed critter, washable. Um, I often get a lot of questions about, you know, where did the celly design come from? You know, how did you decide to make him that kind of shape or her that kind of shape? And so really what we were aiming for when we created Celly is we wanted to create something that was very neutral. So we know that cancer treatment can have its ups and downs. And kids can be happy, sad, mad, glad, any given moment during treatment. So we wanted something that kids could then um, project whatever they were feeling onto it. So if they were having a really bad day and they wanted to make Sally mad or sad, they could. If they were having a good day and they were just playing with Sally and it was just fun, they could do that as well. So we didn't want to push them into any kind of feelings. We wanted something very neutral. We also wanted to create something that was gender neutral so that boys or girls would be equally likely to engage with it and something that was small enough to lug back and forth to the hospital if necessary um, and we use the zipper mouth to store the different cards in it. So if a particular child is dealing with some certain stressor and they're using one of the cards, sometimes they'll stuff them in the celly's mouth or sometimes they'll stuff an entire DS in the celly's mouth, um, you know, however they want to use it. The coping cards come in a deck of about 30. So we've identi identified about um, a number of different stressors that kids experience. And the way that the coping cards are set up is that at the top of every card, there's a specific stressor. And for example, in this card, it's I can't sleep. And then there's bulleted ideas of different things that the kids can try. Um, and some of these ideas, again, are based in research. Some of the ideas are based in recommendations from our oncology experts. And some of them are, have come direct from our families here at CHOP who made suggestions about the things that they do to help their child deal with those stressors. So they're very, very specific strategies. Also on these cards, we leave a space for the child or the family or the medical team to write in their own ideas. So if none of those techniques are working, or maybe one's working, but you have other ideas, you can personalize it so that it's specific to their child. On the back of every card, there is a picture of Sally doing one of the coping techniques as well. So we engage the Sally toy into the coping techniques. You'll, you also might notice that some of the coping techniques include Sally. Like, for example, in this card, they say, you know, make a schedule of relaxing activities to do every night before bed, like read a book to Sally. So it engaged Sally's into some of the coping techniques. Another example up here is I don't like needle sticks, port access, or spinal taps. And I always like to use this example because this is one of the most common um, struggles that we hear from some of our families. Um, and again, there's sample strategies there, like, for example, squeezing a stress ball be before being poked for a blood draw. And so that strategy is an example of one that's really practical. So if you get the blood flowing, it can be easier during a blood draw. Listening to music or playing video games. So that's an example of a strategy that's based in research. Um, using distraction can help when you have a short-term procedure that you're go un undergoing. Um, squeezing, telly sites, squeezing celly tight and looking at celly until it's over. That's an example of one where we've integrated the Celly tool into the coping kit. Um, and using a hot pack in a spot where you're going to get poked, I think that was one of the ones that one of our family members had suggested. So we have a combination of different strategies on each of these cards. And there's multiple cards, so the needle six cards have, have a few more cards to it. So talking a little bit more about the caregiver book, um, the caregiver book is really intended to help guide the caregivers in supporting their child's use of the Sally kit. Um, we want to provide tips for parenting a child with cancer as well. So parenting a child with cancer is sometimes different than parenting a child that has healthy development. We wanted to make sure that we could address some of the other common stressors that caregivers face. And we also wanted to be able to design the whole Sally kit so that parents could implement it without additional assistance. So one of the ways we use the caregiver book is to help provide instruction to, to parents about how to use the kit. 
So if you take a look at this slide, you can get a sense of the different content that is in the book. So we've divided up the different um, challenges into a few different sections, including communication, appointment and procedures, adjusting to treatment, treatment side effects, school and friends, the whole family, and then some other section, uh, some other where it includes a few other additional things. And so if you look at some of these tips, you'll notice that some of the tips in the caregiver's books parallel the tips on the coping cards. So for example, the tips about sleeping. Um, there's a specific caregiver page in the book that says my child's having trouble with sleeping with specific tips um, about what to do about that. So the child can find the card or the parent can help the child find the card and the parent can find the page in the caregiver book and it can be used together to help support the child and the family. The caregiver book is set up um, very similar to the coping cards. So it's not like other books where you have chapters. It, on each page, there's, these stressors are listed across the top of the page. And then there's bulleted information, again, just with very specific tips, again, from research um, and expert suggestions and family suggestions as well. So once we developed the kit, we conducted a research study. And this research study had 15 children here at CHOP. And they were ages between 6 and 12 years old, diagnosed with cancer within the past year. There were, uh, we did semi-structured interviews. So we asked kids and parents before we gave them the Sally coping kit, what are the kinds of stresses you're experiencing? And what are the kinds of um, coping strategies that you're using? And then we introduced them to the kit, and then we did follow-up assessments a, one, a month later and asked them again about their stressors and coping and how they use the kit. And one of the reasons we asked about the stressors and coping before the kit and after the kit is we wanted to make sure that the kit was comprehensive, that we weren't missing anything. So this, these are just a few of the results from this research study. Um, basically, our families tell us that the coping cards are easy to understand. Um, most of them were able to understand how to use the kit, children. Um, they liked the appearance of the kit generally. Um, some of the parents must, might have had a few ideas about presenting it a little differently. A majority of the families noted that the kit is fun to use, um, but I was actually surprised about that given that the use of the kit is really um, indicated when things are tough. So it's not surprising that the numbers are a little bit lower um, because if something's really challenging, the kit might not be fun to use. Um, we're more hopeful that it's helpful to use at those times. Um, all of our families um, said that they liked the coping cards and they liked the tips in the book. Um, they mostly felt that there was good tips and good advice and the information was trustworthy. And 100% of our parents said, yeah, we would recommend this to other families. And about 80% of, 86% of our kids, so most of our kids said they would also recommend the kit to other families. So then one of the things that we were most interested in was understanding how are our families using the Sally coping kit. And what we learned was um, one of the, the um, common themes was that families use the kit to initiate conversations, to normalize experiences, so to um, you know, talk about how this might be um, similar to other kids that experience cancer. I remember one mom telling, telling us when we walked in that she's like, oh, I thought my daughter was the only one who had this. Um, and so um, she felt that this was really helpful for their family just to show that this was a normal experience, a, a normal experience within the cancer um, treatment journey. Um, some of our families use the kit for education or to learn new ideas about coping. Um, also to promote emotional expression, so to help kids kind of get some of those feelings out. Um, for some general comfort, like hugging and cuddling and sleeping with Sally. Um, and for fun. I, I believe that there's Sally played with a number of stuffed animals along the way as well. So thinking about what did our families learn from the kit, our families told us that they learned about ways to promote communication about cancer within the family. And we thought that this was something that was really important. Um, and we were really pleased that this was helpful for families in this way. They learned about common reactions and experiences for families who are facing pediatric cancer treatment. They learn about uh, some new coping techniques, um, for example, using distraction, um, creating a motto for um, dealing with cancer. 
Um, and the kit provided 150 unique tips that were not mentioned by families. Um, so there's a lot of information in it that our families weren't just automatically using and automatically understanding. So um, going sh again straight to the parents and children. Um, so parents talk about how they use the kit. Some of their, their kids use it at night or when they're feeling sad or tired. Um, parents talk about reviewing the cards to see if their, his, their child's feelings were similar to other people, making their child feel less alone. Um, increasing their level of comfort about talking about cancer um, and helping kids know what questions to ask. Some of our children um, use the kit when they weren't feeling well, um, looking through it, identifying the cards and seeing if anything there was anything they could do in trying it. And I think that was definitely one of my favorite quotes because that's exactly how we intended them to use it and to hear the child be able to identify like that that's what they did. That was um, definitely um, exciting to our team that they were able to use it in that way. And another one of my favorite quotes is, I sleep with Sally. Sally's the bomb. It helps me a lot. Um, and so that child really using Sally for comfort in that way. Um, and then talking to my mom, learning to talk to their mom, breathing, you know, helping them calm down. So again, speaking to communication, but then also some specific breathing techniques as well. Um, so in summary, th what we've learned from our research with the Sally Kit is that parents and families felt that it was really relevant to their cancer experience. The kit was something that could be helpful to them. Um, it was comprehensive, um, easy to use, very engaging. So families, you know, remembered it. They, 100% um, of our families in the study reported that they used it during um, the month where they had it, and we did let them keep it. We didn't take it back. Um, our families were able to implement strategies with very little support. They didn't feel like they needed more support to be able to use the strategies in the kit. Um, and we also think that um, given what we've learned from the kit this and this research, that the Sally Coping Kit might be able to help us disseminate some of these evidence-based strategies at, at a low cost so that we can reach more families um, and give more families these tips and suggestions. Um, so just some information about getting a kit. So if you're a CHOP patient, um, kits are free to all of our families here at CHOP. Um, and there's a few different ways you can get a kit. You can go on the website, sellycopingkit.org, and there's a place where you can request a Selly kit through a link on the website. You can email selly at email.chop.edu um, and request a kit that way. You can also ask your medical team for a kit, um, and they can help figure out how to get, get you one. Um, and one of the reasons we're able to provide kits to all of our patients at CHOP for free is from donations from the Elena Leah Shapira Education Fund, the Toyota Foundation, and the Coach Wax Foundation. And I do want to mention that the Coach Wax Foundation has been hosting um, fundraisers every year to make sure that we are able to provide a kit to every single one of our um, cancer families. So they are available um, to our families here at CHOP. If you're outside of CHOP and you're interested in getting a kit, um, you can go either go to that website link that's on the slide up there, or um, you can Google buy Sally Coping Kit, and the link will come up, and it will tell you how you could purchase a kit or the information that you could give to your medical team if you're interested in seeing if the hospital can get one for you. So we have a couple of questions to ask. I'm actually going to um, I'll leave the answering questions slide so that I can put the resource slide up here for you. Um, so that you can take a look at the resources while we answer these last questions. Um, so you see the Sally Coping Kit resource up there. You also see a link up there for um, some materials for the adolescents and young adults um, resource through the oncology service here at CHOP. Regardless of whether you're at CHOP, there's some really great resources up there um, for teens, adolescents, education materials. The Starbright World um, link is up there as well, and the remission link as well. Um, and then another link to some of the education materials um, at CHOP. Um, so those are some great resources. So I'll go ahead and leave those up as we enter um, the question phase. So one of the questions that we got is um, about being in the maintenance phase of treatment and that um, when you don't look sick, it can be really challenging um, when people ask if, they're, if they actually are sick. Um, and then 
becoming really upset if they get questioned. Um, so how do you appropriately respond to these people, and how do you help ease the pain that this, that the son is feeling? So I think actually that this probably happens to a lot of kids, and particularly teens. I'm, I'm not sure how old this child is. So um, one of the things um, that we would talk about with patients who are experiencing this sort of thing is identifying um, supports um, for your son of the people who really do understand what your son is going through. Um, so when we think about, again, going a little bit back to social support. So if a situation comes up where your son or any child is being questioned about um, their illness or is it real or they don't really think that they're sick, who are the people that, they, that he can go talk to? And when he feels upset about that, identifying, you know, who are, the, who are the supports in his life, you know, that he can talk to. If things like this happen at school, sometimes we've um, suggested that, our, that patients make arrangements with the guidance counselors or a teacher that a child is particularly close with so that they can, you know, kind of go take a minute, vent it out. Um, but then also spending time educating our patients about, you know, people often don't understand cancer and they don't understand what it's like. Um, so just a little time under, with spending on understanding kind of the other perspective. Um, and I think as a parent that can be really hard because what you want to do is go, you know, correct those other kids. Um, but since that's out of your, out of the, the control, um, really working and just being there for your, um, each of our children and being there for your son when he comes home or when he's upset about those sorts of things. Another really great question that we have is, I find it very hard to plan for things or think about things that are several months or years away. Are there ways I can try to get past the fear of the future? So I think, again, this is something that's really hard for a lot of our families. And I think with cancer and cancer treatment, um, it, the reality is there is a lot of uncertainty in the future. Um, and it is hard to make those kinds of decisions or make those sorts of plans. Um, and a lot of times when it's in the really rough moments, what we do suggest is being in the moments and not thinking too far in the future. Um, but I think really um, maybe partnering, again, going back to the idea of like finding the, the support for yourself and um, working with other family members or working with the people that are um, supportive in your life to help determine like what what is the level of fear that you, like, at what point should you start planning these sorts of things? And if you plan them, you know, what will, what will happen if they don't work out? And just talking through some of those things with the people that you can really trust. And if you find that you're, not, you're really not able to plan things and it's really a barrier for you, I would definitely recommend talking to the medical team and possibly um, getting some more support for yourself to work with somebody um, to, help, to help you get through that. So a few more questions um, that we can talk about. Um, what is the age range for the Sally kit? Um, and so one of the, um, the research we've conducted has been with kids ages 6 to 12 years old. Um, but we've used the Sally kit clinically with kids as young as, I think, 3 years old. Um, some of the parents have gotten the parent book with even with 18-month-olds. Um, and we've used it with our teenagers as well. So I think it really depends on the family and if, and if you think it could be helpful. All the research was conducted with kids ages 6 to 12, but we've, kind of, we've used it for a much larger age range at our hospital. Um, do teenagers find the celly childish? I think this is a great question. And I was um, even wondering sometimes when we were doing the research with the 12-year-olds that used the celly critter. Um, and one of the things that we learned, I think, from our research and also clinically is um, they don't have to use the, the celly critter. I know one of our kids, for example, gave the celly critter to a younger sibling, but then used the cards, or the parent used the book and the teenager used the cards. Um, some of our teenagers just cuddled up with it and used it as a pillow. Um, so I think it kind of depends, again, on the teenager and, and of the differences. But I think one of the great things about the kit is that there's something in it um, kind of for everybody. So you can either use the cards and the critter, or you can use a book and the critter, or any kind of combination of the both. Of both. Um, and then uh, one more question about the story behind the design of the Sally kit. Um, 
So Selly was um, developed based um, when I was doing um, some work, seeing some patients in oncology clinic. We actually developed a big, ugly, stuffed glob that we were using um, and some of the coping cards that we were using clinically. And then um, we noticed that some of our kids really responded to using the cards and using the stuffed critter. Um, so we decided to expand it and go from there. And so um, we just started talking to more families and getting more information um, about how it might be helpful and really expanded it and made it into a more formal tool. So um, I think that's good for the, the questions, unless there's any other questions coming through. No? All right. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, also feel free if you have questions to visit the psychosocial um, website and you can request more information um, through the website. There's a link on there if you have questions or further questions after today.